From Bloomberg Quick Take, I'm Renita Young. Now, this pandemic has caused a lot of people to think about their financial futures, especially when it comes to saving and retiring. And really, can anyone even retire in this economy? And today on Your Money Story, we have Aman and Christina Browning of Our Rich Journey. They saved $2 million in eight years while working government jobs and side gigs. They became financially independent last year and they retired at the age of 41 and 39. Guys, welcome to the show and thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you for having us. We are excited to be here and, and share our story, maybe inspire some other folks to retire early. Yeah, thank you so much, Renita. We're so excited to talk to you. Great, great. Well, let's get right into it. You two did not come from money, yet you were able to retire pretty young. How did you do it and how does it feel? Yeah, I, I love that we get to start with that question because I think it's so important to inform people that you don't need to come from money in order to understand and start to begin to learn financial literacy and to retire early. So, I mean, if you're talking about financial independence and you're talking about retiring early, there's really three pillars in terms of how you support that journey throughout your whole journey and then retiring early. And it's about saving more money, it's about making more money, and it's about investing that money. And so that's what we really focused on throughout our entire journey on those three things at the same time, continuously working on those things and improving those things so that by the end of our journey, after eight years, we had amassed enough money in order to retire early. And to your question about how it feels, it feels <laughs> good. Because when we were when we were on this journey and, and, and it, it, you know, it seemed like we were able to do this in a relatively short amount of time, mm -hmm. but when we were in the midst of it, it was a lot of work. So to finally be here, to, to be in a place that we visualized for years and years and years, it, is, it feels really good to have achieved our goal. It must feel good. I mean, uh, to still have your whole life ahead of you, um, but, I got to push back there. A lot of people feel like this is too good to be true. Do you think people can really do this right now with the economy that we're facing? Yes. Yeah, I mean, to me, we talk about the whole journey, about retiring early and about even how much you need to retire early, right? And it's all relative. Some people may say, I can't, I can't amass millions and millions of dollars to retire but it's actually relative. I mean, we're a family of four. It depends on your location. It depends on your expenses. And so I think, you know, we talk about those three pillars about saving more, making more and investing more on the road to financial independence. But one thing that ties all those things together is your mentality. So if you go into something, and I think this is general in life, if you go into something with this negative attitude that you cannot achieve it or that it can't be done, then it's very likely that you will not achieve it and it won't be done for you. But if you go into this journey or anything else that you do with this mindset that you can do this and that everything that you do, you're looking towards ways that you can save more money, that you can look for these high side hustles to make more money. And you're learning about investing and investing that money. That's really what it takes in order to achieve financial independence. I think financial independence is really for anyone, but you have to start off with that proper mentality that you can achieve that early retirement and that financial independence level. So how were, how, what were some of the ways that you guys use? I saw on your YouTube channel, several different ways that you made money, saved money, and you invested. Run yes. us through how you did each of them a few ways. Well, it definitely took a combination of things. I mean, there was no one single thing that got us to financial independence, but what we started with was a plan. And the first thing we did was identify what our fire number was, how much money we needed to retire. And then with that number, we had something that we could be intentional about working towards. And so it was just a matter of backing our way into that number. And so we looked at our biggest expenses first. We looked on the saving side first and we looked at ways we could save money. So we did things like we house hacked, we lived uh, in our home, we did something called a live and flip. We, um, we downsized significantly 
And we did, you know, we stopped trying to keep up with the Joneses. We were driving uh, a X5 BMW. We were living beyond our means. And we just started to look at different ways that we could save big ticket items. And then we worked our way down to the little ticket items. And now as far as making more money, when you're on this journey, you realize that there's actually money in the streets, right? So when, when you have a number that you're working towards, you can identify things to, to meet those goals. So we were doing things like retail arbitrage. We were doing things like one day we were driving along and we saw a garbage bin full of these wine crates. This, 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 this wine manufacturer was throwing away all of these wine crates. And we said, that's art. So we can, we can make something out of those crates and resell those things. So there you have it. We were reselling those. I mean, create, Christina created an Etsy store where she was writing tooth fairy letters to people that were you know, buying them around the world. So wow. you have to be creative. And from saving mo money and then making more money, we were able to take that gap and invest that into real estate or into the stock market. And if, you're, if you have a plan and you're working towards it as intentional as we were, you can, you, can, you can reach those types of goals. You can reach financial independence. And I'll also add, I mean, there's one other thing that I wanted to add too, was that we were very creative in terms of creating money from nothing. So Amon gave the, the example of the wine crates, but we also went through this phase where we were creating furniture and we were reselling the furniture and we were making them from pallets. You know, the pallets that you get from the grocery store. You can mm -hmm. get those for free. We started tearing them up, using the wood for that and building furniture and selling that on Facebook and, and Craigslist list. And hmm. it's like, it's like I said, when you're going through this process, you start finding ways like, Hey, I can get money this way. I can make money this way. And even if you don't have any money at all, it's sort of figuring out ways to start generating money from scratch. Okay. And we have a question from the audience actually of uh, is retirement an important goal? And what do you use for your income now? Yes. Yeah. So I think there's, there's two things that, well, there's the FIRE movement, which is financial independence, retire early. Okay. And so I don't think retiring early has to be for everyone. I think it doesn't have to be an important goal, but I do think that financial independence should be an important goal for everyone. So that retire early is just an added on aspect to it. Because if you reach financial independence, it means that you have a, you have amassed enough money to live on for the rest of your life. So if you wanted to retire, you could, but if you don't, you enjoy your work, you enjoy doing what you do, you can continue doing that. And I think it gives people so much more freedom yes. to pursue what they want to do. If they love and enjoy their work, there's just less stress involved with it when you have financial independence. So I would say retiring early may not necessarily need to be a goal for everyone, but I think that financial independence should be a goal for everyone. And in terms of income, it's tied to your financial independence number. So we started off investing in real estate and the stock market. We were flipping real estate and we sold our pro we sold our property, took the profits and put it into our stock portfolio. And so now once you reach financial independence, you have a stock portfolio that you live off of and that generates the income for, for you. And it's called the 4% rule. And it's basically taking 4% from your stock portfolio and that you, that you use that to pay for all of your expenses. And so it's tied into that financial independence number that you would need to achieve in order to reach financial independence or also add on that extra component of retiring early. Okay. Thank you for explaining fire. That was definitely yeah. a question I wanted to make clear from everyone. And it sounds like what you've done is really by time. So you have all this time now and how are you spending your retirement and do you get bored? <laughs> oh no. <laughs> no, we are spending our retirement however we want to. And that, you know, when we were working, there were so many things that we wanted to do, but we had 40 hours a week that we had to give to someone else. Now that we've taken those 40 hours back, we can do whatever we want with them. And so Christina and I, we are very active. We're outdoor people. In fact, we just bought a house in the country here in Portugal. Mm -hmm. And we've been spending a lot of time renovating our house. We plan on putting this entire 
farm in our in our backyard and trying to live a little bit more sustainable. But we do things like that. We spend time with our children. We travel. And of course, we make our YouTube videos once a week. We just have fun talking to people about financial independence on YouTube. And, you know, we're still parents. That's what's really cool about being early retirees with children is that we get to be involved and engaged in our children's lives. And we don't have this gnawing feeling of work on us or something else pulling us away from the attention that we can give our children, our family, our friends. And I think that goes back to what you were saying, Renita, about should retirement be a goal for everyone? Mm -hmm. And you have to think about what would your retirement life look like once you retire? If you can't envision that, then you may get bored in retirement. And maybe that retirement component isn't something that you should strive for. It should just be the financial independence component. But if you see yourself working towards something, you're working towards a life that you envision in retirement that you're enjoying, that you're staying active, that you have so many things that you want to do, but you can't do them because you're working, then maybe that early retirement aspect added on to financial independence is what you should be, is what your goal should be. Mm -hmm. Okay. So were you guys always this good with money? <laughs> I love that question, oh Renita, goodness. because no, you know, when we, when we were growing up, we, we had, you know, very completely different families, of course, like different, different concepts about how to raise kids. But between the both of us, our parents did not talk to us about money. We didn't come from families with money. We weren't raised to understand. I didn't even know what the stock market was when I was growing up. And our kids now, we have a 12 and 14 year old. They are very well versed in the stock market. But growing up, we didn't have that background. We didn't understand how to invest money. And so for us, it was a process of learning, of becoming financially literate and understanding how to invest in the stock market and not getting thrown by these get rich quick schemes and really understanding what is an index fund? How is that different from an actively managed mutual fund? What's a REIT? You know, all of these types of things we really taught ourselves so that we could be savvy investors and so that we could grow our portfolios. Yeah. And, and to take that a step further, you know, whenever we learned something, we would we would put it in, into action. I mean, the first time we invested in real estate, we had read a book about lease options and we thought this is the best strategy for us to get started in real estate is to go into a lease option. And this was way back when we had first like we had, we had graduated from college and we we couldn't afford to get a place of our own. But we figured out another way to get invested in real estate. So for us, we're always about taking action. You can only learn so much, but you need to take that next step. And that's what we're always telling people. You, you, you've watched enough of our YouTube videos. You know what to do. And I think most people do. They're capable of taking those steps. It's just things hold them back. You know, they have limiting beliefs. They, you know, they, they have people in their lives that aren't supporting their goals. And the thing about me and Christina is that when we have an idea and we bring it to one another, we get to yes. We, you know, when we first thought about financial independence and we brought up this crazy idea, Christina was like, how can we do it? Okay, let's put together this plan. And we just, we just got to work doing it. So I mean, it sounds like you guys have to, have, uh, yeah. I'm so sorry. I didn't, no, 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 no. but I had to jump in because <laughs> you seem as if you are talking about the importance of having a mate uh, on the same page when it comes to your financial literacy. Well, that's powerful. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, it, it definitely helps the journey. That's, I mean, yeah. there are definitely people in situations where one is a big saver and one is a big spender. And you yeah. have to, in that situation, it's like you have to find a way to come to the middle. You're not going to convince the other person to become this saver just like you overnight or the saver isn't going to become a spender overnight. Sometimes you have to work towards the middle and then start to really refine how you look at money that way. But 
being on the same page as your spouse is definitely, definitely a huge hurdle that if you're already there, you don't have to overcome that hurdle. Mm -hmm. And it's also, you know, being on the same page as your spouse, but then also being entirely supportive. And I think that is something between us that we really focus on when we have this harebrained idea of, hey, I want to retire before I'm 40. When Amon came to me and said that, you know, it's very, I could have very easily said, that's insane. We've never heard of anyone retiring before 40. Why would we ever be able to do something like that? But as a couple, we're very supportive of each other and thinking rather than the first answer being, no, we're not going to do that. It's okay. Yes, we could do that. Let's figure out how to do that. And, and you know, if you're, if you're not in a relationship, if you, if you're going at this alone, you want to surround yourself with people that are that are going to be supportive. Mm -hmm. So your friends and family. I think that you know this is something that you have to be able to consistently do for a long period of time. And if you have people that are in your ear, on your shoulder, you know, just throwing hate on your journey, it's going to stifle you. And so if you're in a relationship or if you're doing this solo, you need to surround yourself with positive people. Mm. So something else that's interesting about you guys is the whole house is involved. Your daughters have their own Our Rich Journey Junior. So how can parents get their kids involved in becoming financially independent for the whole house? Oh, my goodness. That's a, that's a great question, because our our daughters, we try to teach them about money in a in a, in a, in a very unique way. So we 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 associate time with money. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you a very quick story. One day we had gone to pick our daughters up from daycare. And I think they were like five or maybe four or five years old. And they were talking about their teacher had this brand new um, iPhone. And, and I said, how many hours do you think she had to work for that iPhone? How many, how many hours do you think it, it, it took? And we sat down, they were real little. And we did this calculation and it was like a week and a half of working. <laughs> That she would have to work for this iPhone, and we've always gone back to that lesson. When you're when you're buying something, when you're when you when you are putting your money out, you are exchanging your time for that. So that's kind of the foundation that we started with. Our children value money because they understand what you what you have to do in exchange for it. You have to give up something for it, and it's your freedom in in most cases, right? So if you can take control of your money. You can take control of your freedom. And that's something that we really try to instill in our kids. And their channel is, is so amazing because they have their own style about talking about money. You know, we're old fogies. We talk about it a certain way. <laughs> but they're able to just have fun with it. Yeah. And yeah. I would say, you know, one of the things when as a parent, when you're thinking about how do you instill these money skills or these money life lessons with your children, the first thing is really to understand that what you do, your children are watching. Your children are understanding your relationship with money by everything that you do. So that's one thing to keep in mind. But another thing to keep in mind is that you shouldn't treat the topic of money as if it's taboo. Mm -hmm. You know, it should be just an open conversation and you should just talk about it naturally. It doesn't necessarily mean every day you sit down to your child and you say, okay, we spent this, this, and this, you need to know this. And just talk about it organically. And as you do that more and more, your children will ask more questions. They'll learn more. We started a custodial account for both of our girls and they understand what they're investing in. They understand how the market works. Our youngest daughter just wrote a report. They had free time in their class and their teacher, her science teacher was asking her about investing money. So our youngest daughter wrote a report on her free time about what market timing is, what the stock market is, what index funds are. And it's just, it's really incredible because they really absorb yeah. things. So I would tell parents, don't underestimate what your children can learn. They are very open to understanding about money if you begin to, if you begin to share those topics with them. Okay. All right. I'll tuck that in my back pocket. <laughs> well, I want to switch gears here. Um, you guys just moved to Portugal and <laughs> lived in a few different places. Uh, you lived in your native of California, the Bay Area. You lived in Japan. You lived in Spain. But why did you move to Portugal? Oh, my goodness. There are there are so many things that are just amazing about Portugal. We talk so much about Portugal. People have joked and said that 
they should give us an award because so many people are moving here after after kind of discovering it. But there are there, there are just so many benefits to being here. You know, the culture is amazing. They're very welcoming. Um, in fact, Portugal, Portugal has been rated, I think, in the top three countries that are the most welcoming of, of foreigners. Uh, the healthcare is amazing. The cost of living is amazing. I mean, there are just there are just so many things. And and we had the, the choice of retiring anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. And we're so glad that we came to Portugal because we have really had an opportunity to just, I think, really savor retirement. Wow. The lifestyle that we have here, it allows us to sip our coffee slowly, to really cherish every moment. And I, I couldn't think of a better place to, to, to move to or to retire to. It's amazing here. Is it also a cheaper cost of living? It is. Oh, it is. most definitely. definitely. Oh my, I mean, because we're from the Bay Area. So yeah. I would say for people that are, are watching this, if they're, if they're trying to think of, you know, maybe I should live to a lower cost of living or maybe... Portugal is a great place yeah. if you're looking to to have and a, there's also a lower a great, cost. Great tax incentives, too. right? Great tax incentives. But I would say if your goal is that retire early component, we had several different places. We're from Oakland, the San Francisco Bay Area, which has a very very high cost of living. We also considered Thailand because we had traveled a lot to Thailand. I'm on studied abroad in college in Thailand. We thought of Spain because we'd live there also. But I think if you're thinking about where do you ultimately want to retire, you need to tie that to your financial independence retire no early number, that fire number, the amount of money that you need to retire. And, and we would really recommend that you focus your number on that higher cost of living. So that's what we did. We focused on amassing enough to live in the San Francisco Bay Area. Because our idea was if we move to Portugal and if we don't like it after a while or if we don't like it right away or for whatever reason we want to move back to the States, we didn't want to get pigeonholed into a place because we're picking it solely because the cost of living mm -hmm. is lower than living somewhere else. That makes sense. And so let's switch back to the present time and about this pandemic. We have a quick question from our viewers. What are some other important financial goals as this pandemic continues? Well, I mean, in terms of financial goals during the pandemic, I think this has really illustrated the importance of an emergency fund. You know, there's there's different rules of thumbs in terms of how much you should have in an emergency fund in case an emergency hits. And it depends on you know whether both spouses are working, if only one spouse is working. But I think a goal should most definitely be if you have not established that emergency fund, always continue to work on that so that you have your emergency fund if something should occur like this pandemic happened. So it illustrates how important an emergency fund is. If you don't have one, that should be your goal. Another goal is paying off your debt, but it doesn't necessarily have to be all debt because in order to reach financial independence, you really have to have your sights on investing. You cannot just put your money in a savings account and let it grow over time because the return on that is so low, it doesn't even keep up with the cost of inflation. So the idea is that you really want to get to a point where you can invest. But if you have debt in the form of very high credit cards, you are exchanging, you know, if you're not paying off that debt, then you're investing, but your return on your investment is likely going to be lower than those very high interest rates on your credit cards. So another goal is to pay off those high debts that you have so that you can focus on getting to that space where you can begin taking all your extra money and investing it. So there's really, it depends on where you are. Yeah. And, and I want to add, I want to add two they're related, but they're not in a sequential <laughs> order, right? So one thing is insurance. I think this highlights the importance of having good insurance in place. And if it's health insurance or life insurance, that's big. Hopefully you already have that in place. The second thing is having another source of income, a side hustle in place, not a second job, a side hustle. Those are completely different things. A side hustle is something that you can start immediately. Maybe it's working for you passively in the background, but it is something that you are in control of. You're not working for, for, for someone else. And the last thing is the importance of having an investment plan in place. Because when this 
pandemic hit, people were very scared and it's still very terrifying. But if you have an investment plan in place, you can focus on what's more important in life, like getting through this pandemic, the health and welfare of your family, and your investment plan can be working for you in the background. Your investments are automated. You don't have to worry about that. So having this, this, this system in place, I think like Christina said, setting up your emergency fund, the health insurance, having your ecosystem in place so that during this pandemic, you can focus on the things that are most important and getting through this healthy and safe. You know what? I'm curious to know what you guys think about college loan debt. You know, there are some mm -hmm. schools of thought that are like attack it as fast as you can. Um, but other schools of thought are more mm -hmm. like, well, take into consideration the amount of debt that you owe um, and go from there. What are you thinking about that? Oof. Well, OK, so we're, we'll talk about it through the sense that someone already has college debt, right? Mm -hmm. Not whether or not you should assume debt while you're going through college. So if someone has debt, I think, Renita, we're sort of in the middle of it. Not that you have to pay it off or not that you have to use that and invest instead. You know, it depends on your interest rate. So if you're thinking about the, the historical returns in the market, on average, it's been about an 8% return. So if you have, and again, it depends on your interest rate with your student loans, but if you have a higher rate on your student loan, then you may want to pay that off first and focus on paying that off. Because, you know, we always think when you pay off debt that has a higher interest rate, you are guaranteed payments where in that, in the sense that you're guaranteeing a lower payment each time you you're guaranteeing a rate of return yes, on, that, on, that, on that payment, right. like an investment, right? Yes, yeah. and when you're investing in the market, for example, in the stock market or real estate, you're not, you're not, you do not have a guaranteed return. So, if you have a higher interest rate on your student loan, you may want to consider paying that off first. Now, if you don't, there's still a mentality associated with debt, mm -hmm. and sometimes people have this mentality that. They want to get rid of debt. They want to be completely debt free. And if you have that mentality and that's the mentality that motivates you, it may not be that the numbers necessarily line up. It may mean like if you do the calculations, you may be better off investing if you look at it from a completely statistical analysis. But mentally, if your mentality is that you must pay off your loan because you don't want that debt on you, you don't want that hanging over your head, then maybe you should also be focused on paying off your loan. Now, if none of these apply to you, then you have the other option of just paying off the minimum requirement for your student loan and then investing the rest. So we're sort of in the middle on that one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's it really depends on everyone's situation. Yeah. But you know, when it comes to investing, certain investments, you only have a window of opportunity to make those investments. Like mm -hmm. a Roth IRA, for example, or getting the match in your 401k, you have, to, you have to look at it in a very comprehensive way. You don't wanna throw all of your money at your student loan and miss out on these opportunities with your 401k or being able to invest in a Roth IRA. Okay. So you, it all goes back to having a plan in place. And if you're if you if you just have tunnel vision, you may miss out on all these opportunities. And we talk to people all the time that were so focused on their debt that they missed out on these opportunities to grow wealth somewhere else. You have to be able to do more things than than, than just one. I get that. Okay. Thanks for explaining that. I mm -hmm. wanted to make sure I got that question in. Well, now I have a few rapid fire questions. And the first one comes from our viewers. Which is better, owning or renting a home? Oh, that's a great question. And I will tell you, there's no strict answer for that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really, we're, we're very tied to numbers and really understanding the numbers. A lot of people think that owning property is the, is the ultimate way to go. You should always own property because if you're renting, you're throwing your money towards someone else, to the landlord. But that's actually not always the case. If you start running the numbers and you look at the cost to rent versus the cost to own and not just ownership, but the maintenance associated with the mortgage or the home that you own. And you start to look at when you're renting, you have more flexibility in terms of where you go. You may more, be more likely to get up and move somewhere else for a job opportunity. 
Those are the things you have to keep in mind. So I would say there's no clear answer as to whether it's better to own or to rent. You have to look at your own unique situation and where you live and really run the analysis. I, I will say one thing about renting. If you're going to rent, that means you're not going to be building equity. And most people that own, they're, they're, they're using it as almost as a savings account. So if you're renting, make sure that if you're saving money by renting, you're taking that savings and investing it. You're actually putting that money to work. Okay. Absolutely. So yes. If you're, if you're renting, it makes no sense to save the money. Yeah. And then the money that you save, you go out and you spend yeah. on a fancy new car or something like yeah. that. Got a depreciation, depreciation <laughs> asset. Exactly. Uh, next quick rapid fire question to buy a credit or to get a credit card or to not use a credit card, which one? We use, we use a credit card and we think that if you can use a credit card responsibly and pay it off every single month in full, then a, a credit card it. is a great way to get points. Um, and, and, and yeah, that's the fastest <laughs> answer I can have. <laughs> okay, makes sense. Also, and this is the last quick rapid fire, what was your craziest side hustle? Ooh, oh, the craziest side hustle. Oh my goodness. Um, Uber? I, well, okay, okay. So <laughs> this is very quick. So uh, when Uber first started, it started in the San Francisco Bay Area, and we happened to be there when they when it when it first started. And at that time, there was uh, there was something going on where they would give you a sign up bonus, and they'd also pay you just to have the app on. And at that time, we lived in 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 the hills of Oakland, and because Uber wasn't that big, we signed up for it at that at at that time. We turned on the app. We got thousand dollars for signing up. We turn on the app and then we got $45 an hour and we never got a call from Uber. We literally just sat in our houses and collected the money from Uber. That was, that was back then. This was a really, you know, this was like the early days of Uber. <laughs> okay. And we do have another question from our viewers. How'd you get so good at content too? You guys have several different platforms that you're on. You also sell courses on your website. Oh, I saw one for people who want to move to Portugal. How'd you get so good at content too? Oh, thanks. That's a great question. It's the, it's we appreciate the, que that. It's the questions from, from people, right? Yeah, we get a lot of, I mean, for us, our content always is generated really from our journey and things that we've experienced. And then we have a ton of comments from people that are suggesting new things. Like, can you talk about how you invest in your 401k? Or can you talk about this side hustle that you did? Can you talk about real estate? So, I mean, it almost seems endless. Like we, yeah. we have so many ideas, but then we also get a lot of ideas just from people that watch our videos and are commenting and suggesting videos that they want to see. Okay. And the last question I have, you always talk about what's your why for FI. Number mm -hmm. one, tell us the importance of having a why for financial independence. And what is your why for FI? Okay. So let me start backwards. I'll say my why, actually our why, because we talk about it throughout this and it ties to the importance of having your why for FI. It's our kids and each other, being able to spend time with each other and not just the, the time where it's getting up, get ready, get go to work, do this. Mm -hmm. It's by achieving financial independence, by retiring early, we have quality time with each other. And now we have quantity added to that time. So we get to spend so much more time with each other and with our kids. And that was our why for Phi. And it's tied to the importance of having a why for Phi because if you ever get to a point where you're struggling or you're thinking this is very hard to achieve, maybe you're not gonna get there. If you go back to that why for Phi, envisioning what it's gonna be like for you once you hit financial independence or once you hit financial independence and you retire early, that is the motivation. And so that's why I think it's so important to really begin with your why for FI and understanding why you're doing the things that you're doing in order to achieve your ultimate goal. It will help you stay motivated. Great. Couldn't have said it better. <laughs> Look, we got the same brain. Do you have anything else to add to that, Amon? <laughs> I mean, Christina hit 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 the nail on on the head. You know, this when we were on this on this journey, it like when people see our journey, they think, "Oh, it was all roses, it was all smooth." It mm -hmm. wasn't smooth. The stock market was going up and down. There was chaos just like there is now. 
over the past previous years. So when we have this Y for Phi, we love to visualize where we're gonna be in the future. And now we're there and we continue to do that. So this, this Y for Phi, it's really the fuel for our fire. I love that we had this going because whenever we had, had a roadblock, we said, one day we're gonna be there and we're here. Okay, well, thank you so much guys for joining us. And if you wanna learn more about Aman and Christina Browning and Our Rich Journey, you can check them out on their social platforms at either Our Rich Journey or Rich Journey. And thank you very much for joining Your Money Story. I'm Renita Young with Bloomberg Quick Take. Have a wonderful Friday. Thanks, Renita. Thank you guys.